Hello! In the following I would like to talk about international applications which contain nucleotide and or amino acid sequences. I would like to talk about first of all what this is all about, how to present such a sequence in an international application, what are the formality requirements for presenting a sequence listing in an international application and what happens if there are any defects in such a sequence listing. And at the end I would also like to refer to what happens with the sequence listing when the applicant enters the national phase. So what is this all about? What exactly is a nucleotide or amino acid sequence? Well simply put it's essentially a sequential row of a certain number of nucleotides, which are organic molecules that make up DNA, or a sequential row of amino acids, which are basically elements making up proteins. So what kind of inventions are we really talking about? It's biotech, of course, but let's take an example. An invention in this area could be the disclosure of a particular antibody or antibodies which can be used for a vaccination. And since these sequences are often rather complex, in order to enable for a meaningful disclosure and a meaningful search, it is really necessary to present these sequences in a particular defined manner or in a certain standard. And this is what we then refer to as the sequence listing, the standard in which a sequence needs to be presented in an international application. And this standard is a WIPO standard ST25 and it's included in Annex C of the administrative instructions. Moreover, the PCT requires and states that where an international application contains the disclosure of a nucleotide or amino acid sequence, the international application needs to contain in the description a sequence listing which is in compliance with the Annex C standard for sequence listings. So how do you need to represent such a sequence listing in an international application? The sequence listing should be part of the description, it should be a separate part of the description and it should be placed at the end of the international application. It should start on a new page and should also have a separate page numbering. Of course, the sequence listing as such needs to then comply with the formality requirements of the Annex C standard for sequence listings. And so what does this standard really all provide for. I'm not going to cover all the details but just to give you a rough idea. So the standard contains certain symbols and formats which must be used to represent the sequence in form of a sequence listing. It lists mandatory items and optional items and the order in which they need to appear in the sequence listing. It talks about the presentation of certain features of the sequence and it also covers how to present what is referred to as free text in a sequence listing and I'll come back to the issue of free text. Now how do you best produce such a sequence listing? It sounds potentially more complicated than it is because what you can do is you need to input the relevant data into a software which is available free of charge, for instance the patent in software which is made available from some of the big patent offices, there are also similar uh, software types and if you input the relevant data into such a software, that software will automatically generate an Annex C compliant sequence listing which you then can include in your international application. How do you then, once you have that sequence listing produced by the software, how do you then furnish it with your international application. Our recommendation is if you have a sequence listing always file these applications fully in electronic form. File it in electronic form and add the sequence listing in text format. That's actually the format that is being output by the software, for instance the patent in software that I mentioned earlier. So it automatically creates a text format sequence listing and just add that 
when you file electronically your international application. Why do we recommend that? Well, first of all, there is a considerable fee incentive if you go about it this way. If you include your sequence in text matter in a fully filed electronic application, the pages of the sequence listing, which could be in some cases enormous, we had seen cases of 200,000 pages of sequence listing in particular applications. These pages do not count as pages of the international application. And as you know, if you have more than 30 pages, you are required to pay a fee for each page over 30 pages. And so if you follow the procedure which I outlined, you would not have to pay those additional fees, which can really make a big difference, in particular, of course, if your sequence listing is a rather large sequence, sequence listing. The other advantage is if you file it in text format, in electronic form, it actually serves right away a dual function. First of all, it's part of the disclosure and it fulfills those requirements, but it's also available to the International Searching Authority immediately in this format because the receiving office can send a copy of the international application containing the sequence listing in text format to the searching authority and they can then do the search based on the sequence listing in text format. So nothing but advantages if you file your sequence listing in text format and you file your entire international application in electronic form. And therefore I would conclude that the paper filing should really be the exception. Don't file your sequence listings on paper. If you do, however, and this could for instance be the case if maybe your sequence listing is only one or two pages long, in this case you need to keep in mind that for the purposes of international search you still need to furnish always a sequence listing in electronic form so that they can do a meaningful search on your particular sequence listing. Now I mentioned free text before, so what is this free text? Well free text in a sequence listing is essentially non-language neutral vocabulary. So that means it's not the coded language that you otherwise find in the sequence listing, but it is sentences which you and I could possibly even understand. What the PCT recommends is that you put such free text, preferably in English, into your sequence listing and you repeat the free text in a part of your description. The benefit of doing this is that when you enter the national phase afterwards with this international application and you've put the free text in English into the sequence listing and you repeated it in the main part of the description, no national office can ask you to furnish a different version or copy or translation of that free text in the sequence listing to them as a national of office. Because effectively they will already get a translation of the free text because you will have to furnish a translation of the description anyway to them. And so part of that they get the free text but then the actual sequence listing, the electronic text uh, format that you have furnished, you don't need to redo that for the purposes of the national phase. Now what happens if there's a formal defect when you file an application containing a sequence listing? So for instance your application contains a sequence but doesn't contain a sequence listing or you did not furnish an electronic version of that sequence listing. Well usually if there's a formal defect in an international application it's the job of the receiving office to ask the applicant to correct. Now things are a little bit different in the area of sequence listings. In the area of sequence listings it's not the RO that will get in touch with the applicant but it's the ISA. The reason for that it's a highly technical issue and so the PCT decided it's better to leave this issue to the International Searching Authority which is better equipped to handle these kind of questions. For instance the question whether the sequence listing really complies with the standard contained in Annex C. That would admittedly be a difficult question for a receiving office to determine so these questions are left to the International Searching Authority. So if the searching authority finds that there's no sequence listing or the sequence listing doesn't comply with the standard in Annex C or hasn't been furnished in electronic form, they will invite the applicant to furnish a compliant sequence listing in electronic form also to them. 
and they can charge the applicant a late furnishing fee if this is not complied with out front. And so the applicant always is well advised to make sure that he complies with all these requirements as early on as possible so that he doesn't have to, in a particular case, pay a late furnishing fee. If a sequence listing is submitted after the time of filing or corrected after the time of filing, it's important to realize that such a sequence listing can never contain more subject matter or additional subject matter that wasn't disclosed in the application as originally filed and the applicant is actually required together with that sequence listing to furnish a statement saying that he is not adding additional subject matter. If ultimately the applicant does not comply with the invitation from the International Searching Authority. Then the International Searching Authority can make the determination because we did not get a Annex C compliant sequence listing and maybe not in the right electronic format. In that case we cannot do a meaningful search on the claims which refer to that particular sequence listing. So as a last point I would also like to quickly raise the issue once you have gone through the international phase, what happens when you enter the national phase? Now, basically, one thing to keep in mind, the designated office can always require you to furnish another electronic copy of the sequence listing. That is because basically the electronic copy is not forwarded on by the International Bureau or some other authorities during the international phase to the designated offices. So they are entitled and in need of an electronic copy for the processing of that application during the national phase. However, what they can require is really only a sequence listing which is in compliance with the same standard that also applies to the ISA and to the IPA, which is the Annex C standard for sequence listing. So they cannot ask for a different sequence listing complying with a different standard than the one required under the PCT. And so the good news for applicants is once you comply it with that standard, except for the fact that you might have to send in another electronic copy of your sequence listing, you should not have any formality issues with your sequence listings. So I hope this presentation gave you a bit of an overview over the particular treatment of international applications which contain sequence listings. I was explaining to you how such sequences have to be presented in form of a sequence listing and what particular correction procedures apply in this instance. Do remember that if you have a sequence listing file the international application in electronic form and add the sequence listing in text format because this simplifies the procedure for you and it also has the fee incentive which I mentioned earlier.